Hello and good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Today I have the tremendous pleasure of talking with Dr. Shankara Shetty again. Now, for those who don't know, I first was introduced to Dr. Shankara Shetty through Professor Chris Newton. I think it was about June of 2020. Um, 2021. Now I'm getting confused. And he had said that there was someone in South Africa who was doing tremendous work with COVID-19. And I remember that very first conversation with him. I was blown away with what he was doing. At the time, it was, I think, 4,000 patients, zero deaths. He's now over 10,000 COVID-19 patients, zero deaths. It's incredible. And so hearing about his journey, where we are now and the future of COVID-19 is incredibly valuable. Now, there's one more important point that I'll have to share is that through that work together with Dr. Shetty, we are now part of an international organization, Doctors Federation for the World. This is an organization looking to change the paradigms, and we will be introducing some of the concepts to you as well. I am the president, and guess what? Dr. Shetty is the vice president. Wonderful to have you here, Shankara. How are you doing, Mr. Vice President? Um, are you okay today? Hi, Philip. Uh, uh, welcome to all your audience as well. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine, as well as can be under the circumstances we face. Excellent. And for those people who don't yet know, what I wanted to do is to take them through the journey as to where you're from. Because when people hear South Africa, I'm, I'm just going to share my screen here um, a minute, uh, Shankara. And this here is Google Maps. Here you've got South Africa down here. And then right down um i have to find oh my goodness i've lost it again oh there we are there is port edward and port edward is technically just a resort town isn't it and the nearest yeah. major city is durban which is how far away it's about 170 kilometers away from me 170 kilometers and the nearest hospital is here in margate isn't it yes and that Margate, is 35 kilometers away from where I am. And it's 35, 35 um, uh, miles away. So, and this is a small hospital. It's not a major hospital. And we can see that. What is this area here? Is this just forest? And what is this? Where are you looking, uh, Philip? It's a zolly bend. That, that now is the Eastern Cape. That little river that you see south of Port Edward is the border to the Eastern Cape. The Eastern yeah. Cape is one of the most rural provinces and it has a paucity of any medical care. So mm -hmm. Port Edward is the closest town where medical service is actually available. So I service quite a large proportion of that southern community. So a lot of this very rural community is dependent on the services from you and just probably what, one or two other physicians in Port Edward? Yes, there's, uh, there's actually uh, three of us here in Port Edward. Uh, the closest next physician is in Margate. That is in Margate. And just to give some more context is that when we look at the, this is a picture from where in, in your um, office? This is from your that's office? Actually, that's actually from my lounge in my home. Above, <laughs> my practice. above the practice. <laughs> my son picked that uh, he was pretty, uh, yeah, he noticed the clouds that were gathering outside and he decided to take a photograph of what was going on downstairs. So, so that's here my on the right, my practice. yeah, this is your tent that you are treating and still are treating COVID patients. This is where the patients sit here. Yes, I had to and triage them, Philip, and put the positive COVIDs under that shelter. And I had a separate shelter on the side for those suspected of having COVID. And yes, and across the road is the civic center. Yes, that is the, the local civic centre. Luckily, they provided me parking facilities because I had to close my parking lot uh, for the pandemic. I can see in the distance here, see, how far are you away from the beach? Uh, actually, that, that actually extends around. I'm about 100 metres away from uh, the ocean. 
Wow. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so th th this is the stage, and I'm setting that stage so that people are very, very aware that this is not, um, this is important. Oh, look, we've got Daniela, um, part of DFW. Um, oh, and thank you, Daniela, for being here. Um, so this is rural community. So it highlights just how important it is or was what you were doing at the time. So just for people who have never seen or heard any of your previous things, just say what you were trying to achieve at that time when the pandemic was starting in 2020, why were you thinking outside the box? Uh, Philip, uh, I looked at all the information globally uh, before the pandemic got to South Africa from a very scientific uh, perspective. There was a lot of inconsistencies coming out of the information. We were hearing about asymptomatic spread. We were hearing about uh, a whole range of different things that didn't make much sense. So uh, I knew uh, about the pathology presenting to hospitals, but I was under the impression that we were missing the initial uh, progression of the illness, and I thought that that would bring us a lot of understanding. So I decided that I needed to see every patient physically myself from the day they got ill and see how this progressed to the point of needing critical care. And that's the reason I pitched a tent out there. There was a lot of fear in my community uh, it was put out that uh, your doctors needed to do virtual consults, so patients were very concerned that they wouldn't avail themselves of my service. So I very quickly uh, spoke to my community, settled their, their, their concerns, uh, put up a tent, and I made sure that I was available through this pandemic. After all, being a doctor, I couldn't hide away at the time of most need. And I think I had the scientific background to be assured that I'd be safe. Uh, and so I decided to fall back on the science, uh, what I knew, uh, practice what I knew, and have a good look at what the clinical presentation of the Ill illness was and try and understand the pathophysiology behind it. And that was, that was the motivation for, for actually putting up the tent and setting up my, the, the process of examining patients. Now, before we get too much into the details of, of what we're talking about, I think it's very important to highlight what we mentioned at the beginning with Doctors' Federation for the World, because it was after, I think, maybe two presentations together that I was invited and I thought, let me bring this expertise. And we did a first presentation where we did both science and experience. And we then got involved with Doctors' Federation for the World since then. So this is now probably coming up to about a year. And as, as it evolved, because Fanny, and for those who don't know, Dr. Fanny Casalo from Italy was the founder. She, her roots are in Peru, and she was determined to help the South, uh, South American um, population. And so she helped to pull all these resources together. So what I want to do before we talk about anything else, I just want to highlight a little bit more about Doctors' Federation for the World. It's a tremendous honor to be president and tremendous to have you as vice president. And we're hoping that we're going to make a difference in the long term. So this is just a very short video just to give people an idea as to what is coming in the future. Doctors' Federation for the World is an international organization that over the last two years has played a relentless, productive and important role on five continents. DFW has built hope and broken paradigms. Founded in 2020 in Piedmont, Italy by Dr. Fanny Casalo. DFW is a nonprofit organization which has been endorsed by numerous health specialists from all over the world. Our aim is to address acute and chronic diseases from a pathophysiological point of view with a long-term approach in which people from five continents participate on a voluntary basis. Our innovative, disruptive and constructive strength has enabled real-time interdisciplinary communication and work of health specialists with simultaneous translation into four languages, English, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. Our mission is focused on providing integrative health solutions for human well-being. Our vision is to become the leading international organization in the search for safe, accessible, effective and efficient treatments and preventive interventions. Our management is based on four main pillars. 
Clinical Practice Guidelines, Traditional and Integrative Medicine, Impact on Communities at Risk and Public Policies in Crisis Situations. At DFW, we are convinced that only by dreaming big, working tirelessly, staying focused, and working surrounded by valuable people like yourselves, will we achieve and exceed our goals. We invite you to be part of our DFW family and help us with your donation to support our technological structure and translators. Doctors Federation for the World thanks you for listening. So yes, thank you um, for that. And so uh, Shankara, even before we start going into a little bit more details of the past, present and future with COVID-19, what was it that caught your attention with regards to DFW? Did, why did you think that we needed this? Uh, Philip, I could see <clears throat> the inconsistencies in how the science was being applied. Uh, and when we presented to DFW, uh, clearly, the science was what was at the forefront, and they acknowledge that uh, they're an organization that is non-confrontational. We need to bring the world of science together, and so I felt that we need to avoid the controversies, but let the science shine through. And the principles that DFW was built on attracted me to, to them as an organization that I would love to be part of. So the aim of the organization was to be uh, founded in science, uh, to be ethical, to make sure that everyone has a voice in the decision-making process, uh, to be all-inclusive. And I think that's what we need. Uh, there's too much of division in, on, uh, when it comes to COVID and when it comes to healthcare. There's too many players that seem to have undue influence. And I think DFW strives to level that playing field and create equity amongst all the different branches of healthcare. And so that's that's the main attraction. Thank you very much. Yes, I agree completely, uh, Shankara. I think that there have been many lessons that have been learned through the pandemic. And I think for from my personal perspective, we haven't given enough attention to really digging in, into research and understanding primary pathophysiology. And usually when I say to people, what I'm talking about is the fact that we have essential hypertension, we still don't fully understand it. We have type 2 diabetes, we still don't fully understand it. Cancer is expanding. This cannot go on. It's not good enough to just use pharmaceuticals to try and manage disease. We want to find a way to reach to wellness in the context of disease. And so that leads us right into what it was that you achieved, Shankara. So again, I'll repeat to others that you managed to keep all those semi-rural patients alive and you used it with a combination of antihistamines and steroids. How did you do that? Philip, I think clinically it was, it was obvious from the examination of patients. Uh, all I did was uh, I had my focus in the first wave on the breathlessness that was reported around the world. And I wanted to understand the pathophysiology behind that breathlessness. So I educated every patient about the onset of breathlessness and to report timelessly to me once that, once that showed. And so that I could understand what was causing that breathlessness. And a few things became very apparent very early on from the examination of, of these patients. Uh, what I found was that every patient that presented with breathlessness did so on the eighth day. They presented with, every patient that had COVID presented with the usual viral illness, which was unremarkable. Uh, I treated it symptomatically, uh, and a majority of patients showed signs of improvement by about the fifth day. Some earlier, some took a little longer, but most by the fifth day showed signs of clear improvement in their, in their illness. But a subset of patients presented back on the eighth day with a very sudden onset of breathlessness, which was unusual. These patients were clinically well on the seventh day and suddenly had the symptom present on the eighth day. So it wasn't the usual progression typically that we'd find in a pneumonia. It was too sudden of onset and too rapid in progression to be a pneumonia. 
So on the eighth day, I examined these patients to understand what the underlying pathophysiology is. None of them had crepitations. Very few of them had uh, constitutional symptoms of, a, of an infection. So the, the fever was non-existent in a majority. With the dyspnea, uh, none of them showed any restriction to airflow. So none of them were wheezing. None of them had uh, peak expiratory flows that were decreased. However, they had restriction in expansile capacity of the lungs. So none of them could take a deep breath. So they were breathless rather than showing any asthmatic kind of symptoms. So from looking at this, I thought I'm dealing with a kind of allergic reaction in the lung that was very sudden in onset and very rapidly progress progressive. When we look at allergic reactions in this subset of patients that deteriorated on the eighth day, allergic reactions, depending on your propensity, can either be mild, moderate or severe. And that's what I saw on the eighth day. Some patients presented with very mild symptoms that resolved relatively spontaneously over a day or two. Others presented with moderate symptoms, which persisted for a pro prolonged period, but did not uh, present with any challenge to their life. And then there were some that had very severe reactions that deteriorated very rapidly. So when I looked at that progression, I realized that those that were severe, severe in presentation were those that were ending up on ventilators. And those with moderate illness, if untreated, were those that were now presenting as long COVID. And so the modality of treatment followed that perspective, that I was having an immune response to something on that eighth day. And so you know, the, the treatment basically followed that clinical observation. You know, Shankara, I remember when you told me that. I was blown away that it worked so well. And at that time, I was doing research on looking at what was happening with COVID-19. And one of the things that I had found was that the pattern in SARS-CoV, so that means the epidemic in 2003, and MERS, the epidemic in 2012 in, in the Middle East, the disease pathology was very similar, which is that the lungs got overwhelmed with certain immune cells called macrophages. And this seemed to be driving the response. So when you said antihistamines, it made no sense. I was thinking that antihistamines work on mast cells, not macrophages. Why would you have this kind of response? And so at the time, I had to go right back to the research and think, because at the end of the day, if it works, there must be a reason. Why did it work and why did it work so well? So I'm just going to take a few minutes to explain my thoughts, because the other thing that you said, which stood out, was the eighth day. In order for a patient to, or patients to get unwell with such a consistent pattern, it had to be something that was replicated in everybody. It couldn't because an infection, you know, anybody gets a chest infection. Some people get bad on day three. Another group will be bad on day five. You won't get this very consistent pattern. And so when I looked at it, um, and I'll just show this here, is that this is the picture um, of the of the lung. I'm just going to, sh to show this lung here because the virus then evaded interferon, which is why people didn't have symptoms. It would then go down into the lungs and it's not until it hit the lungs that the interferon response occurs the interferon response then causes a whole accumulation of white blood cells in the lungs and that's what happens by day three and so when i thought about what you described by day eight which would be about day 11 it took me to this here when I looked at this, and this is showing the virus peaking here and then dropping off quite quickly. So in effect, by the time the patient is getting on well, the virus loads are falling off. So the thing that stood out here is the rise of IgG. When this occurs, that's when patients get on well, that's day 11 to 14. And this pattern here is where the immune mechanism comes from. And so uh, from, from my point of view, so as you know, I'm, I'm focused on ACE2 and autoantibodies to ACE2 being the driver for severe disease. These antibodies or autoantibodies based on, on our um, hypothesis are going to cause the macrophages to release products which stimulate mast cells. 
then you get the histamine release. Because there's an important thing you said that you found that the patients didn't get better if you didn't use the antihistamines early. Yes. Uh, the antihistamines had the best effect if started as soon as the symptoms arose. If you caught patients later, there were other sequelae that needed to be addressed, which couldn't be addressed by antihistamines alone. So if you caught a patient on the eighth day, irrespective of the severity of the presentation, if you gave them an appropriate dose of steroid uh, and the antihistamine, that showed almost immediate benefit. I've had patients recover from 70% saturations to 85 within a few hours. And by the next day, back into the 99%, not requiring any oxygen at all. And that's the reason I've never had oxygen in my practice. But that quick speed to recovery dictated that if you stop this reaction immediately, quickly and aggressively, then you negate all the sequelae. But once you allow this reaction to persist for a few days, then you get downstream effects of these chemical mediators. And so we saw the hyperinflammation and the coagulation uh, problems uh, later on. In, in. So I noticed that the inflammation set in by about day 11 and the coagulation started to become an issue by about day 14. But if you caught the patient on day 8, you never had any of those, uh, those sequelae. So I had to educate my community about the importance of that vital day and quick and aggressive uh, treatment of that that, uh, that sudden trigger of the immunity. You know, Shankara, your, after we did the presentations and it started to get traction because I think over 250,000 views and then people were, were reaching out to you, you were asked to interact with certain countries in Malaysia, in parts of India, you know, in different parts of the world. Why did none of the major first world countries step in to ask what was going on? What, what do you think? I think, uh, <clears throat> I think we live in to a Western-centric uh, universe, Philip. Uh, that's one of the things I think made, it, made an important uh, impact. But uh, the West looks at uh, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials to get evidence but uh, I think that is a construct of the pharmaceutical industry, and it shouldn't be necessarily applied to medicine. Uh, when something works, it works, and it can be replicated. So, yes, uh, when, when, I, when I discussed with you initially the pathophysiology, I think there were uh, quite a few physicians around the globe where it made absolute sense. And uh, very quickly, Malaysia called me uh, into trained doctors there, uh, the Marfum Group in Malaysia. Uh, decided that I should come and educate doctors on the pathophysiology. And uh, we've had a meeting a year down the line, and they've all managed to replicate the exact success that I've had. So I think sometimes uh, we as treating physicians on the front line don't have the time to correlate all these results and then publish it and put it into uh, randomized clinical trials. But it shouldn't go unnoticed. And I think it's just the way we practice medicine that's very different in the East and the West. Uh, in the East, there's a paucity of, uh, of uh, finance to do all the relevant testing and that kind of thing. And so we rely on clinical acumen, uh, on how we see the patient, how it relates to pathophysiology, and that dictates how we treat patients. So I think with the East itself, it's the experience of physicians that comes to the fore, rather than any randomized trials or published works of science. You know, and there's an important point in this is that one of the lessons that I have seen as we have had some of the conferences with DFW is some incredible presentations from people across the world. I remember what was the name of the guy who did the nasal vaccine using a, a, a virus that infects, I can't even remember which animal it, it was and is non-pathogenic in humans. It was genius. And, and these people are not getting the attention and the time. How do we get around this where there seems to be almost a snobbery of expertise? I think, Philip, it's that snobbery of expertise that's led us into this crisis in the first place. Uh, I think that we need to realize that... Uh, the medical journals are not the custodians of knowledge. Uh, 
uh, knowledge uh, comes from all different quarters. And I think uh, we need to be able to listen to all the different information around the globe and then try and verify it. Uh, that's what science is supposed to be about. Science is meant to be questioned. It's meant to be challenged. And that's how scientific discovery and scientific uh, improvement takes place. We question everything. And if our hypotheses are correct, then it fits all manner of picture. But as long as there is something that doesn't make sense, then we need to question it. Now, it doesn't mean that the sense must come from publications. It can come from doctor's experience. And I think that's what a lot of the world has missed, that there are doctors around the world that are in direct contact with patients and see their clinical improvements and understand the pathophysiology behind it. It might take time to get understanding of that pathophysiology, but sometimes in the case of a pandemic, we don't have that time to verify uh, certain achievements. And I think it's vitally important to be nimble in the way we institute these, these kind of findings. So we should have a system where these uh, kind of discoveries are quickly investigated, verified, and actually brought to the fore. Uh, there shouldn't be agendas in this. The agenda should be focused on the patient in front of us as a representation of humanity. And if anything has benefited that patient, then all resource should be directed in that direction to verify, to research, to understand, and to implement, rather than implement based on modeling and what we think might be the solution. Uh, the mm -hmm. results on the ground should speak for themselves. It brings us right to one of the questions that um, many people have with regards to the challenges with ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. It's one of the strangest situations where you have some countries in the world using it as a standard and other countries banning it as being ineffective. How in the world do we have a situation like that? I think, Philip, it's, it's, it's a lot of controversy. Uh, the Lancet article that uh, derided uh, hydroxychloroquine fed into that narrative. I think uh, what's important is to understand that the pathophysiology of the illness dictates uh, the kind of intervention. Uh, if I had to look, I've used both medications, but both are not the gold standard. Uh, on their own, they are not going to solve the problem. Uh, with hydroxychloroquine, my aim with hydroxychloroquine was to find a broad antiviral for the initial phase of the illness. And uh, hydroxychloroquine, with its broad antiviral activity, up to this day still works well for those patients that seem to have a high viral load. And so I still use it, but not in every patient. The other reason for hydroxychloroquine was its immunomodulatory benefit. And seeing that I was dealing with an immune dysregulation on the eighth day, I expected that I would get some benefit from hydroxychloroquine. But very early on, I realized that it takes a while for it to work. And the eighth day was upon us before I was getting the immune modulated benefit of hydroxychloroquine. And so it was relegated to treating the high viral loads. From the perspective of ivermectin, uh, in its treatment of filarial illness, ivermectin showed benefit in clearing lung eosinophilia. And there's a group of drugs that do that. And so I used ivermectin only when patients started to desaturate. Uh, because I was concerned that they were de I was dealing with an eosinophilic infiltration of the lung itself. And it worked in that situation. But I've had patients take ivermectin prophylactically. It seemed to have some benefit from studies done in India. But I've also had patients on prophylactic ivermectin get COVID, go on to a higher daily dose of ivermectin, but still have the eighth day worsening it didn't seem to have a benefit in immunomodulation on that eighth day. So I think these two drugs have their place in the treatment of COVID, but they are not the gold standard and we shouldn't punt them. It will bring false hope like the vaccines have done to some, uh, to some extent. So everything has its place. It has the time for it to be used. And I think uh, uh, our preoccupation with specific medications is unwarranted. This is a disease that evolves, and as I've shown, the treatment changes as the disease evolves. And so we need to go in lockstep with the evolution of the disease itself. And you've led us perfectly on to the next question. <clears throat> when we saw that vaccines were coming, 
what were your thoughts at the time with regards to how this would impact the pandemic? What was your thought? Philip, I, I looked at it from the perspective of traditional vaccines, uh, either live attenuated vaccines or heat kill vaccines. And of course, a vaccine is a secondary measure. Uh, when we deal with any illness, our aim is to curb mortality and morbidity. Those that are not ill are secondary. And if we have the ability to curtail all the mortality and morbidity, then it makes a vaccine unnecessary. There are a lot of illnesses out there that we know how to treat. And if no one is injured or dies from that illness, the vaccine is wholly unnecessary. And so with the initial results that I had, it was I was of the opinion that the vaccine was not really necessary if we could treat this illness and allow natural immunity to play its course. I think in the first uh, interaction we had, you posed that very same question to me. And my answer was that a vaccine salesman would have a tough time selling his product in my neck of the woods where there's no mortality or morbidity. And I think that's what we should have been looking at from the start. Uh, the vaccine uh, is meant to prevent the infection itself. Unfortunately, we've all focused on the virus, but I think that COVID is less about the virus and more about a protein that triggers an immune response. And so a vaccine would have limited benefit. And seeing that it's taken us this long to get the understanding of the immunity around COVID uh, to the greater medical fraternity, the affectation of the immunity of a planet with a mass vaccination campaign might be irresponsible if we don't understand the underlying mechanisms. And so the vaccine rollout could have has actually complicated the evolution of COVID in immeasurable ways. Those are very challenging statements. And I know that there are people across the world who would say that if we didn't have the vaccines, the death rate would have been significantly worse without the vaccines in intervening. And I, I would have to say that vaccines have helped, in my view, the high risk group. But you're quite right. If they did understand how to treat the disease and they were using a strategy that would prevent mortality anyway, then yes, you're right. Uh, a vaccine is less of a concern. But I guess from their perspective, they had nothing else. Did you even anticipate that we would be where we are today? Not really, Philip. <clears throat> I think when I, when I figured that we're dealing with a biphasic illness with an immune phase that was responsible for all the mortality and mobility, I realized that uh, the adjustment in the way we treat the illness from a pharmaceutical perspective would curb all that mortality and mobility. Uh, I wished that I could highlight that and curtail the mortality and morbidity and make vaccines really unnecessary. Uh, very early on, I realized that I was being sidelined. Uh, there was a push to mass vaccination. And uh, of course, uh, there's this, even today, this constant narrative that there's no treatment for this, uh, for this virus or for the illness that this virus triggers. And I think that needs to be addressed. We have safe, effective treatment strategies. And if we allowed that, we wouldn't be sitting with the, with the dilemmas we have today. Uh, even looking at the vaccine itself, uh, we look to the vaccines to protect those at risk. But those at risk seem to be the ones most injured by the vaccine. Those with cardiac issues, the, those with the hypertension, diabetes. And if we look at the side effects that the vaccine has, has shown and the adverse events, it precludes those people at the highest risk from taking the vaccine in the first place. So with the thromboembolic complications, with the neuropathies, with all the different things we've seen as adverse events from the vaccine, as physicians, we should not be allowing those subset of patients to be vaccinated. Yet they are the ones claimed to be benefited the most from the vaccine itself. And so that's, that's something that cuts both ways. We need to relook at what we're trying to achieve. Those are some tough um, statements, you know, um, Shankara. And I, I mean, as I said, and I've listened to you for a long time, and you're quite right, if you have been able to achieve a situation where your patients are not dying from COVID-19, then the question would really be asked, why would you vaccinate them in the middle of a pandemic? Does it make 
things worse. Now, for, for those who have been following me, I have always been focused on the fact that COVID-19 looks more like a viral mediated autoimmune disease. What that means is that it's not the virus that kills people, but it's the immune response to the infection that causes severe disease, kind of like a bee sting doesn't kill you. It's the immune response to the bee sting. I've, I've heard you say that on a few occasions. And so in that context, that's where I would be looking to say we ought to be cautious with how we use it. And my perspective was that you target the high risk group. If you're going to gamble with any group, you gamble with the group that has the highest risk for severe COVID-19. But this leads us into part of the other question, which is why is there not more discussion about complications that can occur with the vaccine? Is this still a, a random thought that there is no evidence for? I think, uh, Philip, <clears throat> there are too many economic and political goals at play uh, that are governing uh, the science, which is, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, in the second wave of the pandemic, we had a mutation in the virus, uh, which the mutation only affected the spike protein, and that was the beta variant here in South Africa, and was judged to be the most deadly of the variants. Now, clinically, uh, in the second wave, I found patients, uh, the, the variant was far more contagious, and that ties in with the change in spike protein. We also found more gastrointestinal presentations. Again, uh, ties in with spike protein having an affinity for ACE receptors in the gut. And of course, on the eighth day, I was now sitting with far more severe allergic reactions that required a far higher dose of steroids to suppress it. And so it became apparent that the spike protein was actually the allergen triggering the immune response. And uh, understanding that spike protein seems to be the primary pathogen of this illness resulting in the mortality and morbidity, I would have expected that the vaccine gets re-looked at seeing that they were using spike protein as the trigger for an immune response uh, in vaccination. There are other parts of this virus that we could have used. And so I expected that with the vaccination program, I'm going to see very similar responses to the vaccines because it makes your body makes spike protein would seem to be a pathogen from the clinical presentation of the infection itself. And I think that is something that we should have very quickly realized and modified. Uh, from the researcher, um, again, I, I, I can't seem to remember the name, but he used an avian vac uh, virus as a vector that is non-pathogenic to humans and used it as an intranasal vaccine, and it worked wonders. And this kind of information should have come to the fore very early on. And I'm not against vaccination. I'm just against using new science on a global scale that hasn't been proven, and when it shows problems, we don't redirect and we don't relook at what we're trying to achieve. And so, yes, uh, we could have made a much more safe and effective vaccine that I would, given, I would have given to my patients and suggested it to my patients myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not against vaccines. I'm, I'm against bad science and I'm against injuring patients. So I think, uh, yeah, the vaccines need to be re-looked at. We so got better I, ways to do this. Yeah, so I, what I'm going to, to do is I, I, I've presented on this a few times, and I think... Um, which is that when I was looking at autoimmunity post-vaccination, this is the person getting the vaccine. My question was simple. If the spike protein here binds to free ACE2, will you then get a new protein for which you'll get an immune response to the ACE2 and the spike protein causing autoimmune disease? And this question has never actually been, been answered, which is quite remarkable. And when we look at some of the complications post vaccination, the myocarditis, some of the um, um, some of the long COVID symptoms, it's got to be immune mediated. And so, why we haven't looked at the science of this? This is when I get concerned. Whenever there is political interference in scientific questions, in my mind, this is always a red flag. And any thoughts on this? Uh, exactly, Philip. Uh, it's not that we don't know where the science should go. 
It's just where the funding pushes the research. So there are very relevant things that have come out in this pandemic that should have been looked at, financed appropriately, and got the right research behind it. But that's not happened. It seemed to follow just an agenda. Uh, whatever the modeling showed, whatever the so-called experts uh, suggested, that is where the funding went. And of course, with no funding, science ain't going to move on. We need the necessary funding in the appropriate directions and, of course, a level playing field when we allocate those funds. And this pandemic would have been solved a long time ago. It's just that we've put funding into uh, things that would benefit the pharmaceutical industry or those involved in the pandemic. And, of course, we, we're coming to a dead end with that. But it's being punted to no end uh, simply because of other mean, other motives rather than uh, good health care. And I think that's where that's what we need to look at. And that's where DFW as an organization uh, has gained my respect in that we are trying to level this playing field and make sure that financial uh, uh, constraints or financial uh, uh, people that, that, that finance the organization have absolutely no influence on how those funds are spent. It should be left to the scientists and the clinicians to direct where we look closer. Mm. Yeah, and so it, it brings us into where we are today, Shankar. So we spent some time looking at the past, where we were with the infection, where we were with vaccination. The question now is, where are we today? Have we gone past the worst? Is most of the challenges behind us? Any thoughts? I think uh, <clears throat> from the perspective of the infection itself, most of it is behind us. With Omicron, we're dealing with a far milder variant. It has, it has its nuances that are going to cause us problems. I don't get patients that are critically ill. Uh, we do see the eighth day worsening. The problem that we have is that this worsening is very mild and patients don't present back. So I think we're going to see a lot of more long COVID symptoms. It'll take them a while to realize that they've not recovered completely from the illness. But we are dealing with a far milder variant. And those that are unvaccinated uh, seem to deal with this relatively easily. There was a concern about reinfection. Yes, I've had a lot of patients being reinfected, unvaccinated patients. But this reinfection is pretty mild. I explain it to them as an upgrade to their software program of the immunity rather than a whole new program. And so they present with very mild illness and it's relatively transient. Uh, however, with vaccinated patients, I'm seeing a few complications. I'm noticing a sudden rise in D-dimers, some other complications that seem to be setting in. And I think it's because of the immune mediation uh, that we're having these effects. So yes, I think we're over the worst. But I think the vaccines are throwing us a curveball. And until we understand how the vaccines are impacting on our physiology, it's going to be a bit difficult to understand how the virus interaction with vaccinated people is affecting that uh, disease progression. It raises an important point. And again, because I've been looking at an autoimmune response for some time, one of the things that I'm looking out for is, is a condition that we call macrophage activation where the immune system is almost in a persistent low level response and what people don't realize is that if that is occurring and people have risk factors certainly for endothelial damage so they have hypertension diabetes this process is speeded up and so what you see is the same disease so if someone had peripheral vascular disease and they only had one artery blocked they'll end up with two or three. If they were at risk of throwing a clot, it will be a bigger clot. If they're at risk of having a stroke, it's a bigger stroke. This is very difficult to measure. And unless until we get big data, we'll not be able to see this. Any thoughts from your experience? Uh, you're exactly right, Philip. When I initially spoke about the vaccines and spike protein and all the different uh, pathology that it can produce, I was under the impression that it's going to exacerbate pre-existent conditions. And when patients uh, become critical with those, we're not going to point a finger at the vaccine, seeing that they had some pre-existent condition. And that's what's happening at the moment. People that are having strokes and heart attacks are being discounted because they had some diabetes or high blood pressure pre-existent. And the data is what's vitally important in this. We should be, we are in a phase three global clinical trial. 
And good clinical practice entails that we follow those patients and monitor them closely. We don't wait for a patient to come back to us and tell us that something is wrong. And then because we were part of that intervention, refuse to accept that something is actually wrong. We need to be looking at everyone closely, understanding the progression and uh, correlating that with the data. We'll figure this out if we had good data. Uh, and the collection of the data really falls short of, uh, the, uh, of a phase three trial. Of course, we've also vaccinated the control group. Luckily, in South Africa, I still have a control group. A lot of my patients refuse to take the vaccine, and so I can compare them to the vaccinated patients. But uh, yeah, I think the data is vitally important. When we look at a broad base and when we look at the diversity of affectation from this vaccine, then the data is vitally important in understanding the impact of what's happening. Mm. And it raises a point that you had mentioned before with regards to some of the things you're noticing, even on the reinfections, because you mentioned interleukin-6 and D-dimers and a difference between the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated patients. What, what, what is that about? Uh, Philip, <clears throat> there was a clear progression from uh, on the eighth day in the first wave. I looked at the interleukin-6 uh, uh, CRPs, your C-reactive protein, and your D-dimer. And not to oversimplify, the interleukin-6 are used as a measure of an immune response. The CRPs as a measure of inflammation, and the D-dimers as a measure of coagulopathy. And you could see a distinct progression. Interleukins went up first, and they were followed by CRPs, and then by D-dimers. And that was in the first wave. Uh, in the second wave, things changed because we are dealing with gastrointestinal presentations. And so we still did see the interleukins, the CRPs, and the D-dimers go up. However, with the first Omicron variant that presented on the eighth day more with neuropathy, the markers uh, were, the, the rise in markers were really unremarkable. Uh, and so there was nothing to show this drastic change. However, now with the next variant of Omicron, the BA4 and 5, I've noticed again a rise in interleukins. But strangely, on the eighth day in unvaccinated patients, there is a drastic rise in interleukin-6 levels without a corresponding severity of illness. Patients are mildly ill. They realize that they're not recovering. And so they come back to me and I do their bloods. Uh, the CRP and uh, the D-dimers seem relatively within the normal, but the interleukins are very high, uh, out of sync with the severity of the illness itself, the interleukin-6. However, with the vaccinated patients, I'm noticing as well a rise in the interleukins, but it's only amongst them that I'm seeing very, very elevated levels of D-dimers, and they are requiring anticoagulation. But this seems to be amongst vaccinated patients only. The clotting issues seem to have passed in the unvaccinated. So that's something I'm trying to understand more closely. I'm, we know that the vaccines cause clotting issues, and uh, I think that that is playing into uh, the immune response with infection. You know, I'm, I've been reflecting on that as well, and I'm, I'm going to show you an image here. So uh, I have been looking at the fact that if you have autoantibodies to ACE2, there are two cells that stand out. One is the macrophage because it has ACE2 on its surface, and the other one are platelets. And these are the ones that make clotting. So when you mention D-dimers, if you have increased clotting, your D-dimers go up, which then makes sense. In terms of interleukin-6, it doesn't surprise me that both the vaccinated and unvaccinated would have high levels. But this interleukin-6 here is most likely coming from these macrophages, which suggests that it is some kind of immune response that is targeting these, these immune cells as, as likely to be the cause of some of these patterns. So it, it's within that context that if this is happening, and this is why I am emphasizing it, people think that it's, well, not scaremongering, but the reason I'm focused on it is because if you know that this is happening, it's actually easy to treat. You just use antiplatelets for a period of time until it settles down and then you reduce the risk 
of any of these ongoing immune mediated um, progressions. Why are we afraid to look at this kind of thing? I think, Philip, if we look at this kind of thing, it's an uh, it's a, it's a, it's basically an acceptance that the vaccine is producing side effects, and it seems that uh, everyone wants to uh, avoid getting into that discussion. And I think it's vitally important for us to understand. I've been doing uh, blood smears on vaccinated patients for a while now. We we're well aware that uh, there's this phenomenon of stacking that's occurring. And so I've been doing smears. It seems to be the only unusual presentation. All the blood work seems to be normal in vaccinated patients, even though they feel unwell. Uh, and uh, with the stacking, it occurs in a majority of vaccinated patients. And of course, I've been using that to look at how treatment could intervene. And like, you, like you've shown, uh, with the stacking, I found that colchicine was one of the only drugs that seemed to break up that stacking. But once the stacking broke up, it seemed to progress to microvascular clots, with platelets getting involved very quickly. With withdrawal of the colchicine, the picture went back to stacking. So colchicine seemed to have some benefit in reducing the stacking of the blood. But now I've found that, and of course, it brought platelets into the mix, so now I've put patients on a combination of colchicine and aspirin that seems to, to, for its antiplatelet activity, and that seems to be working pretty well. But at the, the understanding of the underlying pathophysiology is vitally important in the therapeutic interventions that we have. And if we're not going to look closely at all the pathology that's there, then we're never going to get to the appropriate treatment interventions. And of course, that's not going to translate into uh, improvement in quality of life for the patients that are in front of us. So it's something that we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot avoid it. Uh, are we going to do it when we start to experience mortality and morbidity? Uh, we can't wait for that to happen. The few patients that present need to be very closely looked at and everything should be done to understand the pathology around us. Be, there, be it long COVID, be it vaccinated patients, uh, irrespective. We need to understand what's going on so that we can impact on the uh, quality of life of these patients. Yeah, this is these are some important points. And one of the worries that I have as I as I transition in this conversation in our present situation, uh, one of the concerns I have is that we don't seem to have learned lessons from the pandemic because where we are with regards to monkeypox, with regards to the hepatitis in children. And I'm saying, please, please share the data. Do not take anything off the table. And whichever way we take it, in both of these conditions, they seem to be occurring in countries that have high levels of vaccination. Now, that may be purely coincidental, but science doesn't care whether it's a coincidence. It just wants to know the data. But we seem to be afraid to look at that data. And my worry is that it's going to cause us more problems in the future if we don't. Yes, exactly, Philip. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't understand the fear of, uh, of being wrong. I think a good scientist is one that's willing to be challenged and willing to ex accept when there is something that is uh, amiss. Uh, science is something that should be challenged, should be questioned for us to move on and understand. Now, if we've made a mistake, best we admit to that and then try and rectify it rather than try and look away from it. And I think that's a, that has to do, uh, that, that's a lot of what's happening around the world. We're looking away from the mistakes we might have made. And we need to accept that there are problems. Uh, the understanding of how this works can bring us uh, closer to managing future pandemics uh, far more competently. And I think that's, that's, that's a big issue that we need to look at. Uh, we don't close our eyes to any of the data. Uh, you look at the vaccinated countries having this outbreak of uh, monkeypox. Uh, it seems unusual that a disease that was prevalent in Africa and was reasonably self-limiting has now broken out in the highly vaccinated countries and seems to be spreading faster than it did in Africa in its natural setting. Uh, is that related to suppression of immunity? Uh, are, are the highly vaccinated countries now having a population-wide suppression of their immunity and allowing this virus to persist? Uh, are, is the, is the re-emergence of latent viruses like Epstein-Barr and Zoster and hepatitis 
because of this immune suppression? Have we damaged our innate immunity? And all these things need to be understood if we're going to go, go into a future that is brighter and more understandable, uh, we need competence. We need uh, openness. We need to shine lights on the light on the problems, not to try and evade the issues that might be. And I think this is vitally important. The competence of the governing organization around the world needs to be called into question. The competencies of these organizations are just the sum of the competence of the individual players in them. And I think that is vitally important. Uh, the competence of the individual players should not be dictated by outside uh, f uh, economic and political goals. And this is the reason we've been led down the garden path. We've allowed international organizations with agendas to dictate where we go with this pandemic. And it's all been based on modeling, on epidemiology and modeling, rather than good science and the experience and the, uh, the, the, the clinical presentations that are reported by frontline doctors and what they see. That's where our understanding should have started, with the patient in front of us and how they progress. No two are the same. So trying to find commonality is going to be difficult. But if anything works on a patient in front of me, that needs to be looked at. And if I can replicate that with almost every patient, then it should have warranted more uh, research in that direction. I'm going, to, I'm going to put you on the spot with a question, Shankar, and don't answer this if you find that this question is too controversial, but I will say an important point. One of the things that we have not dealt with at an international level is the source of the virus. It is unacceptable that two years beyond having a pandemic that has spread across the world no one can clearly state where this came from, whether it's lab-based, whether it came from a, peng a, a pangolin bat. Because if this was in any way an action that was inappropriate, if they got away with it first, why would they not do it again? Uh, uh, Philip, that's that's... That's exactly true. Uh, I've detected from the start of the pandemic a degree of malfeasance. Uh, I see that uh, the, or the organizations that are entrusted with controlling the health status of the, the world have not looked at the science, and I wonder whether they have an agenda. Uh, I would have expected that when I brought out the understanding of the pathology or the or the, the toxicity of spike protein that we re-looked at what we were doing and redirected because that was directly going to impact on the health of patients that I was, uh, that I was treating. But of course, uh, that never happened. Uh, we've been ignored uh, and the, 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 the science that uh, seems to uh, play into the narrative was all that was highlighted. And I think that uh, we have to call this into question. If we have global organizations that are entrusted with the health of the planet, they must be willing to look under every stone, leave no stone unturned. And that, the, the, the fact that we haven't found the source of this virus is very telling. Uh, also telling is the fact that we took six months to engineer a new vaccine. And now with, the, with Omicron, we've shown it to be wholly ineffective. But in two years, we've not been able to tweak this vaccine. It's almost like saying I managed to build a car in six months, but in two years, I haven't managed to change a flat tire. Makes me wonder, how come? Where is science directed? Why haven't we been able to fine tune what we've done so far? Uh, is there a different agenda at play? These questions, unfortunately, are not, are not controversial. It's the controversy of the science that di dictates those, uh, those questions. The logic or the illogic is what dictates those questions. And I think they need to be asked. Uh, if we plan to move ahead and deal with global health care in a different way and not have the problems we've had with this pandemic, these are the questions that need to be asked. You start Absolutely. from the beginning and you end at the end. You can't leave bits and pieces un 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 uninvestigated. Absolutely. I think that's brilliantly said, Shankara, is that 
we've got to get used to asking hard questions. They may not be questions that we like to look at, but science does not care. And, and actually, science doesn't mind being challenged. If someone told you that the world was flat, you wouldn't lock them up. You would discuss with them and explain to them the science as to why the world is round. And so science cannot be kept in a box. And if there is one mistake that we cannot afford to do is trying to put the scientific process in a limited way because that is not science in and of itself. So where does the future take us then, Shankar? Or what do you see? I think, Philip, we need to, as a globe, we need to re-look at how we've gotten to this point. Uh, I've, I've been working a lot with the, uh, with the legal fraternity. We know about the, the human rights issues that have occurred around the globe. I've been working a lot with politicians around the globe that have uh, seen the, 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 the inconsistencies. So I think this comes back to our individual freedoms, who we give our collective strengths to. Uh, it, if, if not for the politics, we wouldn't have been in this situation. So I think as a planet, we've become complacent with our freedoms. And I think uh, this comes down to who we elect, uh, how we govern, uh, how we allow people to govern us as a society. And we need to relook at the so-called local and international regulatory authorities who have been given powers by individual governments. But remember, those powers are cannot be challenged by us as society. These are unelected, unrepresentative bodies, and so they're given carte blanche. And we need to relook at how they are structured and how, the kind of information that comes out and the repercussions. Because with the bureaucracy of our governments itself, creating a global bureaucracy with international organizations that are not accountable gives us no legal recourse whatsoever. And I think that needs to get re-looked at. Uh, the, the competence of these organizations must be called into question. Uh, you know, when a, when a clown enters the castle, it doesn't make him king. It just changes the castle into a circus. And so we need to look at who's running the show. And I think that's vitally important in this. Well, well said, Shankar. So it, it brings us, as we're coming to the, the, to the close here, um, it brings us back to DFW and for those who have just joined us and I, I think I want to quickly play this two minute video again about a doctor's federation for the world and then we'll have a quick chat about the conference coming up and um, and then we'll close out if, if there aren't any specific questions so um, for those who haven't uh, seen this before doctor's federation for the world is a future that we want to bring to help us to guide us through this process Doctors Federation for the World is an international organization that over the last two years has played a relentless, productive and important role on five continents. DFW has built hope and broken paradigms. Founded in 2020 in Piedmont, Italy by Dr. Fanny Casalo. DFW is a nonprofit organization which has been endorsed by numerous health specialists from all over the world. Our aim is to address acute and chronic diseases from a pathophysiological point of view with a long-term approach in which people from five continents participate on a voluntary basis. Our innovative, disruptive and constructive strength has enabled real-time interdisciplinary communication and work of health specialists with simultaneous translation into four languages, English, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. Our mission is focused on providing integrative health solutions for human well-being. Our vision is to become the leading international organization in the search for safe, accessible, effective and efficient treatments and preventive interventions. Our management is based on four main pillars. Clinical practice guidelines, traditional and integrative medicine, impact on communities at risk and public policies in crisis situations. At DFW, we are convinced that only by dreaming big, working tirelessly, staying focused, 
and working surrounded by valuable people like yourselves, will we achieve and exceed our goals. We invite you to be part of our DFW family and help us with your donation to support our technological structure and translators. Doctors Federation for the World thanks you for listening. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, Dr. Um, Shankara, as we come to the close here and we look forward, we do have a conference coming up in September that can be primarily online, probably for most of our listeners. But we're hoping to tackle some of these points and looking beyond the COVID-19. Any thoughts that you'd want to share about this? Uh, the conference, Philip, I think is a very important event. Uh, we are looking to bring together all sides of the debate. It's, it is focused on COVID, but it provides us a platform for future. So we don't want to be seen as prejudiced. We want all sides of this debate to come together. We want all the influences on the planet to be part of this. And we want everything that we do to be rooted in good science. And uh, that's, that's not a difficult thing, uh, unless the agendas are at play. So we want this to be a conference that unites, uh, be it pro-vaxxers or anti-vaxxers or whoever with any predisposition is invited to this. We want to sit around the table and bring the best science forward and use that science to formulate policy, be it public policy, governmental policy, legal policy. It all must be dictated by the science itself. And I think the focus of the conference is on the science. So everyone, uh, whichever side of this unnecessary debate that we are in, uh, should be invited to sit around a table uh, without any prejudice and discuss the future of healthcare. And of course, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has played too big a part in the direction healthcare is taken. And we have not taken the necessary interest in uh, the other forms of medicine and systems of medicine around the globe, like nutraceutical interventions, regional customs, traditional methods. And I think uh, the Doctors' Federation for the World strives to bring all that together in an integrated, holistic healthcare solution. And for the future, that's going to create a very different understanding of the things we treat but do not cure like hypertension and diabetes and all the other chronic illnesses. We've been in a pandemic for many years, a pandemic of hypertension, diabetes, and those are the things that we need to be solving. They make the biggest difference in patients' quality of life. And I think this is something that is vitally important going forward. That we, we you know, I, I mentioned, Philip, that we as doctors are not healthcare practitioners. We are sick care practitioners. We only see sick patients. We do not promote good health. Uh, and if you look at the perspective of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, good health is not good for business. Every army needs an enemy. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't exist. And I think we need to change that paradigm completely. Uh, the, the, the work we do for humanity should benefit the patient in front of me because he is the representation of that humanity. So every decision we take should benefit the patient in front of me or at least be cognizant of his needs. Wonderful, Shankara. Yes, I, I, I think that I can say as we come to the end that you are probably one of the most eloquent speakers that I have ever seen in terms of giving comprehensive, concise, honest, <laughs> open answers. And I know that our listeners um, really, really appreciate it. And so as we come to the end, I want to say thank you very much and encourage everyone who is interested in learning more about Doctors' Federation for the World joining this movement. Let's change the future of the world. Let's change the way that healthcare works and try and see if we can bring a different kind of health to the world for the future. Thank you very much, Shankara. I know that I'll be speaking to you again in the future. Have a great evening to everyone. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks for having me again, Philip. Much appreciated. You're welcome.